Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, it was a... Uh... It's a pretty great Memorial Day weekend for me. Uh, not exactly a relaxing one uh, because I, I recorded two pretty big podcasts and then launched into a, a kind of big creative project while also getting in a bunch of workouts. But uh, I feel pretty damn energized. So so that's good. Um, last week, I should point out, was a, a trade show in New York City. I was just finishing the intro and getting in the car and heading out. And and because I was so rushed, I forgot my contact lenses and my AirPods. And there's probably all sorts of symbolism behind that. But but anyway, the trade show went well. Um, that said, doing trade shows in back-to-back -back weeks was a little tiring. I used to do this in the before time for my job a bunch. But uh Man, I was kind of zapped. Anyway, um, I do have another show coming up in two weeks in San Diego, this big biotech show. And that means I'm going to be taking my first flights since uh, February 2020, which will be interesting, I guess. Um, I'll stay in L.A. for the weekend before the, the conference, just like I did uh, in the before time. I haven't scheduled any podcasts yet for that that stretch so I, I should probably get on that if you have any ideas and you hear this before uh june 11th and 12th you know drop me a line anyway the uh the, the creative project i mentioned is that i'm finally making the second issue of my zine haiku for business travelers um i got pretty inspired by sunday's conversation which you're going to hear in a, a couple of weeks and i wound up doing a lot of work Sunday and Monday on, on the, the zine to, to get it into shape. I already had sort of a schematic for it and some pieces I wanted to put in and some art, et cetera. But uh, I really just went into overdrive and, and got that rolling. And I, I hope to wrap it up by this weekend. I sort of gave myself that goal, finish it by this Saturday, um, get it out to the printer. Might even do a second printing of the first issue. I'm, I'm just about to run out of those, so it'd be nice to have another hundred or so on hand. But... That said, I'm telling you all this, even though I know I hate making creative commitments uh, in front of other people, at least, uh, you know, if I keep it private, then I can just beat myself up. But uh, I have this tendency to, to peter out and, and let myself down. But I am going to give this a shot. I, I've sort of given myself a, a breakdown of what needs to be finished uh, to get it out. There is a four pa a four panel comic. I need to figure out how to draw ink, etc. during that time, which is probably going to drive me insane but but anyway I'm, I'm gonna do my best and see if i can get it out this summer uh hopefully in the next week or two get it back from the printer and start mailing it my real goal is to make two issues a year uh one around memorial day one around thanksgiving you know both times i'll have a little time to to, to finish putting these things together but that said the first one came out in may 2020 so i have got plenty of work to do um but i am glad to be to be inspired to make and and to share something um and really it's that that latter thing that's more of a concern that's what sort of came up in this conversation on sunday actually sharing my stuff with others because especially with the writing i get way too familiar with the work from draft after draft or just looking at it again and again and i figure no one else is possibly going to be interested because it's just completely lifeless it's lying there after 10 million uh, revisions and I have to realize you haven't seen this stuff yet, and you're going to get it fresh, and it's going to mean something, maybe. Anyway, this one's also going to have some drawings in it, so I don't have as much of a hang-up on, on those, those or that medium. Um, and there'll be poems, essays, and a, another podcast excerpt. And anyway, that's the thing I'm going to try to make in the next week or so. But speaking of expanding oneself creatively and adding drawing to the, the mix... We should dive into this week's episode. See, my guests this time around are Andreas Kilcher and Judith Butler. 
and they've contributed essays to this amazing new book, Franz Kafka, The Drawings, which is out now from Yale University Press. Andreas also edited the book uh, in collaboration with Pavel Schmidt, who is not part of this week's show. So the thing is, um, Kafka was an artist in addition to being a writer, a great writer, uh, one of the greatest of our, our world, and control of or, or rights to Kafka's surviving drawings had been subject to this years and years and years long international legal battle that only got resolved in 2019. And this book reproduces the entire shebang, every surviving piece of, of Kafka's art, his, his drawings and, and ink sketches uh, at full size, more than 160 pieces. And some of them are, are standalone drawings. Uh, some of them are pieces that were in journals. Uh, some are marginalia. Some are integrated into writing, uh, which is a big subject that we're going to talk about in the other conversation. But the presentation is fantastic. The book is just just gorgeous. And, and some of the art is just hauntingly beautiful. They're, they're really tough to, to describe exactly, you know, what, what, how you characterize his art. I mean, some of it is sort of Paul Clay like some of it kind of fits into that German Austrian Czech thing from the turn of the century, but so much of it doesn't. And well, anyway, the, the thing is that the art can just be revelatory, like not in the way of, of complimenting Kafka's writing in a, Oh, that's what Gregor is supposed to look like. But you know, more of a, an insight into how Kafka translated the world in another medium other than language, other than written language. Or Judith Butler puts it in, in our conversation. It sort of constitutes a different way of working with the line on the page. We're seeing how this consciousness approached the world that way and how it compares and contrasts in some respects to his prose. Anyway, uh, in the book... It consists of an introduction by Andreas explaining the history and uh, <laughs> the trials of, of the drawings, followed by the, the drawings themselves in, in full size for you know 160 plus uh, instances, and then essays by, by from Andreas and Judith about Kafka and his art and his writing and his life and times and and how the art informs new readings and understandings of Kafka. Now, Andreas's essay is the more comprehensive and lengthy one. It, it details Kafka's life and social circle and art influences and, and other biographical aspects, but still delves into the, the greater meaning of the drawings and their, their intersection with, with Kafka's written work. And then Judith sort of leaps off of that and explores the theme of, of bodies and uh, oh, gravity or, or lightness in the, the drawings and in some of Kay's, uh, Kafka's stories and, and how they, again, intersect and diverge. I'm not doing either one of those justice exactly. They both contributed gorgeous, profound essays to this book, and they helped give us new ways of approaching the work of, of one of the 20th century's greatest writers and 21st century, you know, given how things are going. And I loved just reveling in the drawings, but... I also really appreciated the, the grounding that both Andreas and Judith bring to the project, you know, showing how the drawings situate Kafka in a certain place and time, while also reinforcing his, his transcendence from both of those. Franz Kafka, The Drawings, is it's a magnificent book, and I was awfully glad to, to get Andreas and Judith together for a, a group conversation. Uh, the book is out now from Yale University Press in the U.S., so, so go check it out. Now, um, as caveats go, Andreas's levels were a little high, and there's an occasional clicking on Judith's line. I tried to correct and minimize all that stuff. Um, oh, and, and I should note, Andreas's pieces in the book were translated by Kurt Beals, because it's always important to credit the translators. Now, here are their incredibly brief bios from the book. Each of them has a much more extensive history, of course. I'll provide links to that in the, the show and episode notes for this one. Andreas Kilcher is Professor of Literature and Cultural Studies at ETH Zurich, and Judith Butler is Maxine Elliott Professor of Comparative Literature at the University of California, Berkeley. 
And now, the virtual memories conversation with Andreas Kilcher and Judith Butler. You know, I, I know in the introduction to the book, Andreas, you, you talk about the provenance of where the, the drawings came from and how we've managed to, to get all of these collected finally. But, but the big question I have, what did the drawings reveal to each of you about Kafka? Yeah, that's that's really a big question. Uh, I know, I know. It's a big opener. I'm I, sure it'll I can, us. Yeah, I, I can yeah. start by uh, saying that uh, we get to know Kafka by uh, a side we hardly knew so far. Um, we knew just a few of his drawings, and uh, we had some knowledge about, let's say, the role of the visual in his writing uh, and of art to a certain extent. But now we know much closer, much more in detail, uh, not only um, of course, the, the scope of his uh, exercising his uh, in, in drawing, but also we understand how important his understanding of the visual of art was for him. And uh, it's not only the art and the drawing that we learn, it's also uh, we have a new access to his writing. Mm -hmm. And Judith, can you speak to that also? Yes, certainly. In terms of, um, yeah. Well, one point that um, Andreas makes um, that I think is is really crucial um, is that, uh, of course, Kafka is a writer. We think of him as a writer, and he will, I actually believe, always will be a writer. I think there are more dissertations written on Kafka than any other German writer <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the history of the world. Um um, but, uh, but he's, he, he also drew and, and how do we think of him as, as somebody who draws, um, the, the drawings are not simply illustrations of what we find in the written text. Um, and they're not simply, oh, um, uh, casual scribblings that, you know, give us some idea of what he did in his leisure time or when his, um, concentration was failing. No, these are these are very deliberate drawings that, um, in my view, constitute a different way of working with the line on the page. Right? I mean, he's writing. He's writing in notebooks. He's writing longhand. Um, he is all the time uh, writing words um, on the page, line by line, following. Um, we might say the the horizontal lines of the written text. And then when he is drawing, um, we might say he's he's liberated from the horizontality of writing. <laughs> um, the lines go in different directions, and um, there are invariably figures, human figures, um, that are are strange, um, in part because they are composed of lines. Um, I mean, some of them have volume, some of them like have a stomach or uh, a face, um, uh, but they're not, they're not proportional. Uh, but some of them are we, what we might call stick figures. That is to say, um, human bodies that have been reduced to lines. Um, and it's neither writing nor is it, uh, representational, but it's another way of working with the line on the page. Um, and I think that this is, uh, illuminating for all kinds of reasons. I can go on, but I'll I'll be quiet for now. Well, it, it, it raised a question for me. It, did you, did either of you feel you know in seeing the, this full set of, of drawings, sort of temptations to interpret the drawings in light of of the writing that you're familiar with, as opposed to you know seeing them, I would say independently as as the work of the same hand, but but a different perspective on the world. Maybe uh, I start again because I can um, build on what Judith just said. Um, that um, I mean, at first, I think it's very important to understand these drawings um, independently from the writing for two reasons. First, 
we have to face the fact that Kafka started to draw when he hardly was writing, namely in his very early years, um, around 1900 to 1905, 6, 7. Most of his drawings um, um, are from that time. Um, I mean, he started to write already in that time, um, but the draftsman Kafka was far more important than the writer Kafka at that time. And um, only later, um, when he started to write uh, his diary and in 1909 and started to publish his first text around that time, uh, the drawing get closer to the writing in a more obvious way in so far as, for example, in his um, diaries, in his early diaries, we have drawing and writing next to each other and also related to each other in an explicit way. So this is this is the first reason why you have to, uh, in a first step, understand the drawings independently uh, and not as illustrations, as Judith just said. And the, the second reason is more, let's say, theoretical, aesthetical. Um, for Kafka, it was um, very clear what the power of the visual of the picture is because he was actually um, not only uh, theoretically but also practically involved in drawing. He knew how drawing works. And uh, so... The, the power of the visuality uh, in next to the, the written, to the writing was very clear to him. Um, and that is another reason why he uh, was very anxious not to illustrate. Uh, and one striking example of that is when his publisher, Kurt Wolf, uh, wanted to illustrate the metamorphosis in 1915, he was very anxious that the insect could be shown. Mm. And, and he was really uh, rejecting this idea. Uh, I, I think you couldn't ex uh, yeah, be more explicit as Kafka was towards his publisher, not to show the insect. I, I think that that's a really important point, that whatever drawing was for him, it could not be... Um, a, an illustration or a representation of the literary text. It was a it was a break with the literary text in a way. Even though what happens in the drawing and what happens in the literary text can can be thematically linked. We can I can show you that for sure. Um, many problematics emerge in both that are linked with one another. But but there's a figure called Odra Deck um, that emerges in a a small piece called Cares of a Family Man in, in English. Um, and um, and that figure is sort of part human, part a spool of thread, maybe a star, maybe several, yeah. maybe a cross. Uh, um, and it's, it's, you know, I've asked my students, like, could you draw this or could you, is is this comprehensible as a figure that could be represented in a drawing? And in the end, we all agree that it's impossible. If you go online, you will see people who have tried to do it, but I think yeah. they actually fail. And they fail in part because um, there's a disturbance at the heart of the literary description that keeps it from being um, uh, a coherent image. And that's his point. Um, something has happened to this life form called Odredek that is no longer coherent as a human being or as an object or even as an animal, even though it has qualities of all three. Um, and similarly, I would say um, that when um, Kafka is drawing uh, rather than writing, um, something happens there which is um, freed of the constraints of of literary language, but also uh, um, it's it's an incom they're they're usually incomplete figures. In other words, um, they're they're balancing on feet that are not feet. They are uh, in flight in ways that no actual body could be. Um, they're leaning in ways that produce uh, a strange relationship between head and arm. Um, they're, they're not composite figures that we can easily identify. You might say, oh, well, this is a human form. Well, maybe, yes, but something has happened to that human form such that it's no longer 
recognizable as human. And it's that disturbance of the human form that he's bringing out in a different way in the in the writing, I think, um, and then, than in the drawing. In the drawing, I think the bodies are relieved of gravity. They're they're relieved of um, uh, uh, of um, co- coordination. Um, they they can be reduced to a line as a almost as an anorexic as- aspiration. Um, they can lose volume, or they can have impossible volume. So there's a variation on on the bodily form that I think happens in a quite different way in the drawing. We can see that in the literary work that Kafka is concerned with that. There are there are moments where a, a, an apparently human creature. Um, lifts up on a bucket like there's a small uh, uh, there's a very small parable called the bucket rider where this this maybe human speaking figure uh, is riding a bucket into the air I mean it's an impossible surreal sur- uh, surreal <laughs> description um, but we might say that something like that comes closer to what the drawings do than um, than say the castle or or the trial um but but there is a, a distinct formal difference between the drawings and the writings that that should make us pause before we understand one as an illustration of the other we can use the writings and i certainly do to to get our bearings in relationship to the drawing but if we make the drawing into a thematic representation of what is already in the writing then i think we're we're losing something yeah, and seeing it as a complement or or subservient to the writing, I think both of you convey in your essays, it's the wrong approach to to take to these things. It's tempting. It would make sure. it easier. Yeah, <laughs> and that's that's the way it has. The, the the drawings have been understood so far. If at all attempts have been made, most of them were fixed to the writing and try to understand these few drawings that have been known so far uh, uh, to uh, to compose them with his writings. And and yeah, I think we made it quite clear that this is um, a problematic approach. Now, how have the drawings changed your your interpretations or, or understandings of Kafka? Have you have you revised you know past opinions and, and approaches based on on the the later release of drawings? Maybe I shouldn't start all the time. Maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe oh, there's should. time for both of you. I think you should, Andreas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> should I? Okay. I, I mean, I I can make a first attempt. Um, I mean, there are so many aspects that could be part of uh, of your question, and uh, one aspect for me is. Um, besides to this somehow liberation from the line and from, from maybe even from space, what Judith is underlying so convincingly, um, is, um, um, the aspect of the comic, of uh, mm-hmm. the grotesque, of, of the carnivalesque. So these drawings, um, they are often, um, I think drawn with a smile much more than you would find in his texts. Um, the texts are not without humor at all. So the humor plays a, a, a large role in this text, but you, you won't see it so, uh, so, th- so quickly. And it's, it's more concealed, more indirect. There are, there are several comic figures in Kafka's text in the castle, uh, and, and even in a trial and, uh, and it's it's reported that even when reading the panel, Connolly, uh, uh, Kafka and his friends, they had to laugh. Um, yeah. But uh, this gives maybe mm-hmm. also even a hint to the kind of humor you find in the drawing. So it, the, this humor, this this comic element, this tends to the grotesque and to the arabesque and to 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 a deformation of what you classically think is beauty but um uh, i mean that's also his bodies they are they are they have this comic element and the i don't know if it's a comic relief it's more like a comic tension you find there um and i think this element you find more uh, explicit in the drawings, but then you can see from there on that the writings are 
also um, somehow, um, let's say, uh, yeah, inclined to this to this type of subversive carnivalesque way of 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 the comic maybe a little bit in the way michael bartin understood uh, the carnivalesque or uh, or kristeva uh, in the, later in uh, in her theoretical writing understood um, the carnivalesque so um this just to highlight one element um is for me something which I, I really learned from his drawings and I think is relevant, um, not in the sense that you find it illustrated, but on a more principal level, also in the writings. Sure. Um, well, I suppose I have just a slightly different um, angle on that. I also um, was impressed by the lightness um, and there is hilarity. In, in these drawings, um, there there are impossible contortions and some grotesquerie uh, <laughs> that um, is quite remarkable. One could uh, one could compare them with Kandinsky, uh, but I think one could also compare them with Clay and maybe um, uh, a, the, a sense of gravity or even horror um, that is sometimes um, uh, communicated um, there. I um, my sense is that uh, very often the the drawings offer figures that are relieved of volume, weight, gravity um, that don't have the same problem of being grounded, being balanced, being coordinated that the rest of us do when we're trying to walk on the street or <laughs> engaging with rough surfaces. <laughs> um, 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 finding our ground, holding our own, um, standing steady, you know, all, all those things. Um, we, we are, we're relieved of gravity and, um, um, uh, of weight, uh, and, and the, and the demand to balance and to find ground, uh, in, in these pictures. And, and I, I see that, uh, I see that, but it, you know, it indicates its opposite in a way. It's almost, like a series of sketches that give us the if only, like if only we were relieved of gravity, what would it be, right? A kind of conjecture or hypothetical. If we, if we were reduced to pure line and had no volume and no weight, what, what kind of ethereal existence might we have? And there are acrobatic motions that are possible. Um, there, are, um, there are ways of taking flight that are possible. There are impossible ways of balancing apparently on nothing on no surface that um that are suddenly there and i i see it as an intense wishfulness to be relieved of gravity and that then makes me think oh how wretched is gravity you know how wretched is weight <laughs> how wretched is the demand to seek find and and steady oneself on ground um uh, how, how difficult is it to be a body in the world, um, trying to find one's way, having mobility um, with all of the impediments that exist? Uh, so uh, I think there's some wretchedness coupled with hilarity, and it's that combination that um, that is, um, I think, quite quite remarkable there. And a huge thunderbolt just came down outside my house, which may make it onto the soundtrack for this. It's perfect timing uh, on the, the strength of that that wretchedness and lightness. But um, to that end, you know, one of the things that struck me reading your essays and and looking at the art was that sense that that writing needs translation, but drawing is drawing. And I'm not sure if if that holds up exactly, or if we're still even in looking at drawings, if, if we're engaged in an act of translation of, of both trying to contextualize what was there or fit it into, you know, a certain uh, time frame for both the, uh, the artist's existence, the influences around him, et cetera. But does this need translation the way the, way the text itself does? Um, I would say that, um, of course, there is a temptation to to think that the drawings uh, can be seen just without any kind of context 
um, and and for sure you can do that. But um, on the other hand, it gets of course also interesting in another sense and adds up another dimension if you also put the drawings into some kind of a context. This is, of course, not the same interpretation that you do when you read texts, but um, uh, it's somehow is similar that when you historicize or contextualize texts, um, you can do that, of course, also with his drawings, even though I think uh, there is not so much context for his um, drawings than might be for his writings. But um, uh, for me, of course, it was also a task and, um, yeah, a, a question that I had to face to try to understand uh, from what from what backdrop did Kafka at all start to draw? I mean, um, he didn't, in fact, not draw from uh, from a point zero from uh, from yeah. from without any kind of background. So, what is interesting is to see that Kafka was uh, indeed um, studying art history during his uh, law studies, and um, also on the side he was very much into art. He was going to exhibitions. He he got to know quite a bunch of artists. Um, among them, like also Alfred Kubing personally, and some of uh, the artists in Prague we don't really know anymore, like Max Horb or Willy Novak, or maybe we know still Friedrich Feigl. He all knew them personally. He bought their paintings, some of them, Feigl's, Novak. Um, and so he, he was actually very open eyed looking at art. And I think it would be a misunderstanding to 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 think that this his drawing is completely free from context, and here he is only Kafka. Um, this would be maybe even a myth. Um, and uh, uh, but nevertheless, Kafka, on the other hand, never really went through a school. So he he was he had a teacher. Um, uh, but he didn't really learn a lot. He even said that uh, his teacher spoiled his talent and <laughs> he didn't really uh, go to a school, uh, an art school in the strict sense. Um, but you see, there, there is a context for his drawing in the artistic sense too, as there is a context for his writing. And, uh, and I think uh, yet the... The important point is that he he did what he wanted in his drawing. So he he never was drawing in Germany. Would say schulmäßig according to a school. He was drawing, um, yeah, in this very individual, very idiosyncratic way. Um, and uh, I think that's also the source of this this boldness just just to draw, not to think. Uh, so th you see, my, my answer will be ambivalent. On the one hand, yes, uh, the, of course, there, there is a context and, and it is interesting and important to understand these drawings in the context uh, of the experience and the knowledge of art that Kafka had. And, and on the other hand, it's also to see uh, important to see that he he was somehow free uh, or he freed himself in a certain sense from from that context and um, i will end with uh, with a, a comparison um because not only kafka also his friend max brod actually what we didn't know so far he was drawing quite uh, quite uh, let's say intense uh, but he was drawing um very clearly according to a school so uh, his drawings might even seem to be in the sense of, let's say, um, how you learn drawing better than the ones of Kafka, but that's precisely what makes them worse because um, there is nothing like a handwriting in his drawing, in yeah. old drawing. While in Kafka's drawing, you see something very peculiar. You, you won't find it so quickly anywhere else. So you, you immediately recognize this, this, this is Kafka's hand drawing. <laughs> mm -hmm.
Yeah, where do you stand? You, you mentioned Feigl among the, the 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 currently unknown artists, basically from from that Prague era. Uh, where do you stand on on Feigl's contention that you you bring up in the essay? The Kafka's art is essentially nihilist in terms of being too analytical. Mm. Do you think? Well, what do you think? Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's that's actually really um, very uh, historically situated. The way Feigl is viewing Kafka's writings, actually, and from there on, maybe also to a certain extent, what he learned as Kafka's drawings. A few of his drawings he saw actually very early because Brod showed them to the group. Um, but the, the historical location is actually the, let's say the the. How do you call that? The, the, the classical Marxist and then also yeah. after that Soviet reading of so-called bourgeois art. And Kafka was understood in the Eastern Bloc as a bourgeois writer, uh, which means at the same time he was a nihilist. Um, he was, um, uh, an avant-gardist, modernist, and uh, which means what he was not. He was not a social realist. So his depiction of the world was not according to reality, much more to what he was imagining, to to fantasy, to the dream, and so on. And, uh, and uh, this was the starting point for this verdict over Kafka, uh, which you find uh, in the GDR as well as uh, in the in the in the Soviet countries at the time, and even in in the England for for left or left thinkers like Feigl, he just uh, took over this this position. You know, I think it it might be important to remember that um, Kafka also worked in the insurance industry, and one of his uh, main jobs was to adjudicate um, for a large company. Um, uh, claims of bodily injury uh, that the workers um, were uh, uh, registering with the company. And he had to decide whether the company was uh, responsible for the injury and even the death of workers who are um, very often working under unsafe conditions. And he found this uh, quite difficult to do. But um, I think that some of the fiction that he has written, especially on law and legal violence and the the problem of um, making petitions um, where within bureaucratic mm-hmm. um, uh, organizations that uh, either deny them or defer them um, was was a was a, a social commentary of an important kind so you know and I think Walter Benjamin understood this as well, that Kafka was uh, mm-hmm. a, a, a critic of, um, of, of certain kinds of uh, ur- urban, um, uh, uh, cer- certain forms of urban violence that were, that were, that were focused mm-hmm. on corporations and um, labor conditions. And some Marxists have, in fact, derived a, a great deal from, from Kafka. At the same time, you know, I I think it's important to remember that um, he was skeptical of uh, a lot of different political positions during his time, and that skepticism is not the same as nihilism. It, it meant simply that he took a distance from strong ideological positions, and people have, as you know, argued, is, was he a Zionist? Was he an anti-Zionist? He said this, and then he said this. How can he have said both? Um, was he a socialist? Well, probably not, but he was a critic of capitalism and its, um, and even a defender of, of labor in certain ways. Um, I think uh, there's an interesting story, and this could maybe bring us back to the drawings. I think it was in 1913 in the fall, Kafka took a trip to Vienna, and he was there um, to participate in an international congress um, focused on rescue services and accident prevention, so part of his job. But across the street or across the way, um, there was the World um, Zionist Congress, um, and um, and 
and he didn't plan to go over there. It was the 11th Zionist Cong Congress, but there were about 10,000 participants there from various countries speaking various languages. And he sat in the back um, and he was listening to these people arguing in different languages, not understanding <laughs> each other. And there were, of course, different Zionisms at the time. 1911, you could be a cultural Zionist and not believe that there should be a land that or a territory for Zionism. It was a spiritual or cultural reality. And then there were others that, no, we need land. And then there was like a debate, like where should the land be? And then there was another debate. You're a political Zionist. You're not. And all these people are yelling. And he sits in the back and he draws – um, the hats of all the people who are talking. <laughs> and these are not acts of realist uh, portraiture. They are, they're these crazy spherical motions, right? Which on the one hand are the hats and they're very different hats, right? You've got Hasidic hats, you've got urban caps, you've got all kinds of things happening. And he's noting that people are shouting at each other in languages that they don't understand. And he's gone into his round and round um, drawing, which I find both hilarious and also historically poignant, like mm -hmm. how silly and how useless and how yeah. crazy are some of these forms of political fighting. So, you know, he's present for politics, we might say, at the same time, he has his distance and the aesthetic, the, you know, the drawing there functions as a kind of ironic commentary on um on, on loud shouting that gets nowhere. And um, and why not? Why can't we translate that to our age? It seems, seems like, well, like a uh, fine translation. As Jews, we've always been defined by our hats in, in certain ways <laughs> and our headwear. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm it's my sneaky critique of Miller's Crossing, the great Coen Brothers gangster movie. I that, that the, Jew, Look, yeah, the I, Jews wear different hats. I so, think yeah. the Coen Brothers and Kafka have a lot to say to one another. Mm -hmm. uh, an awful lot. In fact, tell me about your respective Kafkas. Do, do you each remember sort of, you know, first encountering his work and, and how he's changed for you over the years? Which again, huge well, question. Well, I, but, think I, you know. I think I stole a book from the public library. I didn't mean to <laughs> in high school. In high school, I not only read Kafka, but then I, I found a set of a, a book of commentary and, um, mm -hmm. And somebody found it on my shelf just two years ago and said, you know, this, I think this is where you grew up and you took this from the public library and never returned it. <laughs> so I was always, as you know, I was always teaching. I probably taught courses on Kafka more than I've taught on gender for sure, um, which people don't know, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> um, for, for my whole career. I was wondering myself. No, no, yeah. probably I've taught. Um, philosophy and literature focusing on Kafka for 20 years at least. Um, but I, uh, but I loved Kafka for, but, but my initial response was that he, he was an existential writer. And so he corresponded with my interest in existentialism as a high school student. And then I started reading the commentary and I saw that there were, Oh my God, there's a psychoanalytic one and there's a Marxist one. And there's another one about Jewish cultural history. And oh, I, then I, I just, you know, I was on my way. Gotcha. And Andreas? Yeah. In, in my case, I can say that I somehow late came to Kafka um, especially when it comes to, let's say, to professional dealing with Kafka, like writing on him, teaching about him. So this, this took quite a long time. Um, um, because I, I think I had, um, maybe a too, too large of a respect. So mm -hmm. I, I was somehow afraid to, to touch this too early. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 to be honest, I, I studied Kabbalah before I read Kafka. <laughs> we <laughs> just a backwards way for yeah. a lot of us. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, yeah, it is said that you can study Kabbalah only after 40, 40 or something like that. Yeah. And I, I did it with, with 18 or 19. 
Um, and um, yeah, I wrote my MA thesis on Kafka and Kabbalah, but I started with Kabbalah and I thought, okay, this could be may maybe interesting to understand this kind of riddle texts of Kafka. You mentioned, Judith, uh, the Sorge des Hausvaters with Odradek and there are also others that seem to be much like, very much like riddles. And um, yeah, that, that seemed to me like a, a first approach. Uh, but it's clearly that, uh, I mean, even though Kafka was quite acquainted with, with later than with the, with Hasidic, uh, stories and, and Hasidism to a certain extent, uh, by his friend, uh, Yirji Langer, Georg Langer, um, but, uh, it wasn't really important to him. So he hadn't, uh, a deep understanding of, of this tradition. Nevertheless, this, this was for me actually the door to, to Kafka. But I, uh, until I, I, I started to work really, let's say in a, in a professional, in a more professional way on Kafka, it, it took really a long time. So I, I was very hesitant to publish on him because also, I mean, the, what has been written on him is, is a frightening amount. Yeah. So it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, where do you step in? And actually the drawings, this is, this is really it. This was the moment to step in. Yeah. You, you sort of found an area that it, just because of the, the temporality where the stuff hadn't come out yet. In, yeah, in terms I mean, of being able to, to be the first one in. It's not overworked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, exactly, exactly. So and it, it was, of course, a coincidence uh, of of time and space. And it was also, of course, fantastic uh, that uh, you, Judith, were so quickly open to the, this, this idea to participate in this, uh, in this volume, in this edition. Um, and... Um, yeah, it it was the moment where when these drawings were actually open to public, they have been locked away for decades in a mm -hmm. Swiss bank ward, and and in the moment when they uh, were made access uh, publicly, um, so I jumped in and said, "Okay, that's that's I I have to do that," <laughs> mm -hmm. and this was in two nineteen. Only then they were made accessible. And all of the ironies of, you know, a huge bureaucratic jurisdiction related issue keeping Kafka's work from, from seeing the light of day. Yes. You know, everybody got the ironies of that pretty early. Yes. But, okay. Many debates about who, who owns Kafka. Yes. Yeah. You know, and, and I think, again, Andreas, you do a really good job of, of untangling that in the course of the introduction to the book. Cause I'd, I'd remembered seeing news stories about it over the years and you, you know, kind of lay out the whole jarndice versus jarndice aspect of it to. Yeah. And, and Judy wrote, um, also on that, I think it was in the London Review of Books, right? Yes. Uh, I think an important contribution to this question, uh, in this whole quarrel, to whom belongs Kafka, who owns Kafka. Um, so yeah, this was disturbing, but to me, um, I also have been writing on this trial on the estate of Brod and Kafka. And, uh, this, this was actually the gate to this book because I knew exactly what, uh, was in Zurich in the bank ward because I, I followed the trial and it, it was at the same time, also a fascinating trial because you could learn so much on on uh, yeah the politics of culture um not only in israel also in in germany in, in the states and uh, even in 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 prague um mm -hmm. um but but like this i i was very alert to 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 what was actually uh, and truly in these bank wards yeah. the drawings <laughs> yeah. It is pretty amazing the idea that this sort of thing could be locked away as, as long as it was, and and you know to see it all brought together now is just fantastic. But but how do you see your your essays in the book interacting in a sense? There are moments where Judith's essay, you know, you refer to, to Andreas's uh, um, big grounding essay in, in in the piece, but do you see a sort of complementarity to what you're both writing about? I, th I think so. I mean, you know, on, I think Andreas has um, contextualized uh, these drawings in a wonderful way, but he's also made the 
um, really important conceptual point that we shouldn't reduce the drawings to the writing and we shouldn't um, use the the writing to um, extract the the theme of the of the drawings that you know these are independent um, exercises that clearly comment on one another and are terribly interesting to think about in relationship to one another but we shouldn't take a reductive approach um, like let's let's let Kafka be uh, someone who draws let's let these drawings um, exist I, I I wouldn't take a kind of uh, view that the the drawings can or should be regarded um, as aut autonomous radically autonomous that is to say you you could read them and understand them uh, and interpret them without any historical understanding or without any understanding of Kafka as a writer I think that would be naive and wrong maybe that would be to fetishize the drawings in some way or to claim um, that sure. their autonomy is even greater than it is. At the same time, something very different is happening formally with the drawings. And I think I focused on that part, um, perhaps more than the other essays. I think we all contributed different things. But I wanted to suggest that this is a different way for lines to be on the page and that there's a, a reflection on, 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 on gravity and, uh, and, yeah. and embodied existence here that's happening through the drawings. The drawings are, are doing that kind of thinking, that kind of um, experimenting uh, in, in a way that's, that's enormously important to think about. Thanks. Andreas? Yeah, I mean, uh, the three essays, they have each one, uh, let's say, their, their task. And uh, the, the first one is describing... Uh, yeah, the, the complex and also fascinating history of the transmission of these drawings, including them being locked away for decades and now um, brought to the public. Um, and uh, this, the second essay is uh, trying to understand, yeah, what Judy just says, the, the context of, of Kafka getting to drawing and being interested to art and then starting to draw and, and then of course also relating the drawing to his writing and asking that question without being reductive. And, and Judy's essay, essay for me is extremely important also because um, yeah, let's say the question was, was, was a known, a genuine question. Uh, to me, I think it was the importance of what actually do we see? Uh, these figures, these, uh, the, these bodies that, um, rarely have a clear face. They, they have faces, but they are not portraits. What you uh, would maybe expect that Kafka was also trying to draw some portraits. He did a few self, self portraits and a portrait of his mother. And uh, so they are a few portraits, but I would say the main, uh, the large part of his drawings, they, they show the body, uh, the body of the human being in, in this uh, very peculiar ways. And to me, um, this was the, the, yeah, the, the very difficult question that Judith, I think, answered brilliantly in her essay, trying to, to, yeah, to describe what actually do we see here? What kinds of body? And from that point of view, uh, you can, of course, also relate without being reductive to his writings. And, and this, this was, yeah, th this is the, the, the essay by, by Judith. Sure. You, you both mentioned, you know, teaching him, especially you, Judith, for 20 years or so. Have students' responses to Kafka changed over the years? Have you noticed the way students read him and interpret things being different as, as years have gone by? That's to, to both of you, if either you want to jump in. Um, yes, I think so. Um, I've had students who um, have been interested, for instance, recently in the human animal distinction in Kafka. So, mm -hmm. you know, as we know, there's a um, an important uh, emergence of 
of animal studies and thinking about um, humans as animals or calling into question the ways in which humans and animals have been distinguished. Um, and, and of course, Kafka is very... Um, uh, um, is, is, a, is, a, is an interesting resource for, for people who are interested in that problem. Um, I've had students who are feminists who um, actually wrote some pretty strong criticisms of the trial. They didn't like the way women were por portrayed, and, and that took me aback, even though I am a uh, card-carrying feminist for my whole life, yeah. uh, I, still, <laughs> I saw that they had a different relationship to the way in which um, furtive sexuality was represented in that book. That surprised me. I've had others who um, uh, went back into the archive and found his notebooks and um, were interested in the way that miniature figures uh, work in Kafka Others wrote on anorexia or um, uh, prisons or jailed uh, jailed experiences. Fig figures, animals um, who are who are imprisoned or jailed or put in exhibition cages. Um, there's also, I think, uh, enormous interest on the part of some students in um, the various ways that Kafka reflects on. Uh, colonialism. So, for instance, uh, uh, a very well-known uh, story called Re "Report to an Academy" is um, has a, a figure speaking who is uh, an ape, but also a man, or moves between human and ape form. And suddenly, you realize this is actually a kind of slave figure who is, in fact, exported from the. Gold Coast to perform humanness in front of um, academic and yeah. uh, other yeah. audiences. And that has been the uh, basis of some extremely interesting work. Robert Reed Farr is one literary critic who has worked on that, and some of my students have worked on that as well. And I would say, finally, um, that, uh, you know, indefinite detention is perhaps the main carceral norm of our time where people are who are imprisoned are imprisoned under conditions of indefinite detention rather than kind of being properly arrested and given a, given a lawyer and given a, yeah. um, told what crime they committed. Um, indefinite detention has become so common as we see uh, now on the borders of so many countries that Kafka's work um, is part of a renewed interest in literature and law. How do we think about indefinite detention, people who are in a state of waiting indefinitely? Um, Kafka sure. gives us some important ways to think about all that. Thanks. Yeah, I'd, I'd wondered, I assume there hasn't been a, you know, a Kafka backlash, a, oh, we don't read him anymore, because it always seems as though there's, there's, that he's speaking to, to every, every year that we're going through, basically. And, 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 you know, every theme you brought up really reinforces that for me. So. I think, yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Andreas, do you have a, a shifting experiences with teaching him? Um, yeah, I, I was, uh, while listening to Judith, thinking um, of, yeah, quite some similarities, um, uh, but I, I can probably add more personal shifts than the ones of the sure. students, um, since um, my first approach to Kafka, as I was uh, referring to, was um, to try to understand him in a, in a more in in a Jewish context, uh, which was at that time not so common, even though Max Brod uh, very strongly went to, into that direction, but in a very let's say simple way. And uh, yeah, his um, yeah his understanding and dealing with Judaism was much more complex than Brod wanted it to be. So uh, to work on that was my actually my my first approach. That's why I was mentioning, yeah, the <laughs> this this strange yeah. notion of of maybe kabbalistic ways of writing, um, uh, and um, 
I somehow uh, came a bit away of 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 that, uh, and it has been researched a lot. And um, I I uh, I think about that. What interests me at the moment much more is on the one hand. Uh, the poetics, his, his way of writing. I think this question is still um, rather open. I mean, a lot has been nevertheless said, but um, it's it's interesting because Kafka is in a way quite a classical storyteller. So he, he tells story not like uh, the avant-garde writers at the time. Uh, so it's it's still a quite linear way to tell a story. Nevertheless, um, if you look closer, he uses uh, a lot of measures to to question the, precisely this kind of linear understanding of a story and of of uh, of characters of whatever he describes. So this this contrast between linear telling a story, so and on the other hand. Um, yeah, alienation from everything what um, makes linear storytelling. This I, I, I try to understand more and more. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the drawings now help me quite a lot in that, in, in, the, in the way that um, you have to look in a, in a different way. Um, not, I mean, drawings are not linear because you see everything on one gaze. So it's, they are much more spatial than temporal in their, uh, in their effect, in their aesthetical presentation. And I think this could actually also help to understand his writings, like, uh, especially the ones that, that are quite similar to the riddle. Like, uh, uh, again, I refer to the example that Judy brought, uh, Odradek in Disorder des Hausvaters. This, this one is, it's more like a, a picture. There's, there's not a story told there. It's, it's like an object that if you turn it a little bit, it gets to something living. Then you turn it a little bit more, then it, it alters the shape again. You, you never really know what it is, but there is hardly a story told there. It's more like, um, if you turn, how do you say that in English, a kaleidoscope? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's to me well this this story is like a kaleidoscope. It's like fragments of pictures that you when you turn them, you the, the whole story gets a new shape. So actually, and and um, if I may say something, this will be my next book on Kafka. Ah, oh, okay. Excellent. Oh. Excellent. I usually ask people what's your next book, but I'm always afraid you know it'll jinx them or something and and be a curse. So that's good. So Judith, you were saying? Oh, I just think. Um... You know, uh, um, Walter Benjamin and um, Gershom Scholem had uh, an extraordinary correspondence in the years during which um, the Nazi regime had consolidated power. So 1934 was an important year of their correspondence. And, you know, on the one hand, you would expect that they would be talking about the rise of, of, of Hitler and Nazism and the persecution of the Jews, which had already obviously started through a systematic um, uh, stripping of Jews of legal and political powers, economic powers. Um, but um, interestingly enough, uh, um, uh, uh, they, they turn to uh, a pretty intense discussion about Kafka um, so on the one hand, we would expect them to talk about politics, but on the other hand, they found that the best way, perhaps, to think about their times was to think about Kafka together. And they had a debate, really, between them. Um, Sholem uh, wanted to say um, that um, Kafka shows us that God is um, absent, um, that um, we, we, uh, we cannot find the the law according to which we should be living. Um, we cannot find guidance. Uh, there is no, there is no way we're living in the, in the absence of that law or we're living in the absence of that Talmudic, um, instance of God. Uh, um, there's no Talmud for the present moment as it were. Um, and, and, and 
um, Benjamin responded by saying, well, look, um, in a way, uh, we have to l- learn, we don't have guidance to learn how to live, but that becomes, um, that becomes what we tell stories about. That becomes the relationship between fiction and life. Um, that's, that's what we, uh, that's what we work with, um, uh, as, as material for, for writing itself. And, um, there is, there's no key, right? We can't be waiting around for a key on, on, uh, that will open, open up the secrets of life or, um, provide guidance on how best to live. Um, it's the fact that we are without that key. That is, um, that is our, our modern predicament and, and the, and the thematic focus of our, of our work. Um, and it, it was an interesting kind of uh, debate because, um, at least at that time, Sholem was looking for for legal <laughs> Talmudic guidance, and um, Kafka was taking up the the importance of the story as as a as a way and fiction and writing as as a way of of handling that predicament, um, and and one could go back. Um, and look at the work of Bialik, for instance, on on the relationship of of poetry and philosophy, or um, uh, thinking about the, the the role of of poetry and fiction to to contextualize this particular debate between them. But I think Kafka um, Kafka obviously is always concerned with law, but he's not trying to um uh find the law according to which we will live he understands that the key to that law has been lost and that as lost creatures we have to make our way uh, and i think yeah. i think that that's um that's really important he's not holding out for redemption although there may be flashes kind of messianic flashes that emerge in some of the work, you know, which shows, I think, a kind of Kabbalistic interest on his part. But he's not he's not as interested in redemption, nor is he as mournful about its loss um, as Sholem was. And this, this produces an interesting kind of predicament, not only to think about different strains of Judaism, the way Kabbalah affects fiction, but also ways of living in the present and understanding the proper task of, of art, whether it's uh, poetry, uh, uh, no- novels, uh, fragments, or indeed drawings. And that, that all gets me back to Kafka's final testament, which luckily Max Broad didn't follow through on, destroying every, his desire to have everything destroyed upon his death. How does that... Uh, well, <laughs> how do you square that? What, what's your your uh, interpretations of what uh, what Kafka wanted and what that meant in terms of how he saw the world? Um, yeah, maybe I can start by um, adding to what uh, Judith just said, because this was actually when I said my starting point in uh, Kafka and Judaism was not broad. Um, because he made a much too affirmative understanding of, let's say, Jewish identity, Jewish religion for Kafka. It was uh, indeed Benjamin and, and Scholem. Um, I was at that time studying at the Franz Rosenzweig Research Center in Jerusalem. Um, both of them were like, uh, I mean, Benjamin and Scholem, they were the big names there. And uh, this influenced me a lot in, in understanding this, this very peculiar, uh, I would call it positive nihilism, um, in, in Kafka. So it's, um, it's not an, a, a negative nihilism in the sense that it's just an absence of sense and of whatever. Um, but uh, that's the way things are given. Um, and I think this, this uh, dialectic, this dialectics is maybe also why Kafka um, wanted to express his desire to be preserved uh, in that way. Um, my thesis is that this entire testament is to uh, quite an extent uh, an irony. 
it's maybe the, the, the one of the very rare cases of an ironic testament. <laughs> in the sense that uh, I'm, I'm totally sure that Kafka knew perfectly that Max Brod would not throw away one piece of paper I agree. On, on <laughs> he has written or drawn. He knew that 100%. And um, if you read without the negation sign, the negative sign, the minus, what he says, so... Everything I have written and drawn, uh, all the letters that I, all the, the manuscripts that I gave to, to somebody and please collect them and then burn it. But please collect them. Yes, that's, that's the, that's on the positive side. And then burn is like the, the minus. But, um, yeah, that's the irony. Please collect them and yeah. please guard them for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> Really, uh, let's say 99% sure that Kafka knew precisely uh, what this means and, and Broad understood that. So he knew it. Well, gotcha. you know, there's, a, there's maybe a more cynical speculation that we could entertain as well, namely that mm -hmm. he knew Broad would be trying to profit off this. Off all of this. See, and and that knew. also plays back into my Jewish thing. You can at least leave guilt behind. You know, well, Brad, if you do this, I'm, uh, you're going to feel guilty for the rest of your That's life. That's right. But, and, but yeah. and he was punishing him for in advance for profiting off of him. And indeed, Brad <laughs> did profit off of him and sold some things when he shouldn't have and, and bequeathed them to the wrong people. And he kind of, you know, he was kind of severing that tie at the same time that he was cementing it. And that was the ambivalence of that relationship, perhaps. Understood. So we've done an hour, so I, I should let you guys go because it is a holiday weekend. But I had a couple of questions, and I know this is chintzy, but do you have personal favorites among the drawings? Ah. Uh, you start, Judith. <laughs> I've got the book in front of me. If, if you mention which number it is, I'll, I'll flip to it. This is difficult for me. <laughs> um. Well, I mean, you cite the. Uh, oh, go on. Let's, I I yeah. don't have the book in front of me, but um, I will say um, that uh, I first came across the drawings in Prague when I visited the Kafka um, Society there, and they had postcards, and some of those postcards were these kinds of stick figures who were sprawled across. Um, uh, we were kind of leaning over, head down on what seemed to be a table, sprawled across it. And I just thought, oh, yes, writing is difficult. Um, is this really where I'm sleeping tonight? Um, <laughs> so I have to say those early drawings, um, there's another one where it seems as if um, the stick figure is in, in front of some kind of a board, maybe, you know, in a, in a quasi-pedagogical position. So those those are my earliest ones, and, and I think they remain my favorite. Yeah, I, I see that one as him being in front of a court, the figure, not, not Kafka, but, possibly, but that shows the possibly. guilt laden Jewish thing yes. on my side. <laughs> guilt laden <laughs> Jewish thing is definitely there. Yeah. And Andreas, how about you? Yeah, in, instead of saying I have no favorite because all of them are, I point out one. And this is, um, I have the book in front of me. This is number 26, 27. Um, it's called Ortiness of Wealth. Um, uh, Übermut des Reichtums oh. in German. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a bit difficult uh, because this is actually, unfortunately, the only drawing or one of the very few drawings that hasn't been published on one page. So there is, uh, it's on two pages. Um, and that's why you don't see it uh, in a flat uh, entire yeah, you way. You get the gutter going down the middle. Exactly. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a pity. I, I tried to avoid it, but it wasn't possible. Um, but I think this, um, this kind of... Um, I don't know if Übermut is translated in the best way in haughtiness. How do you pronounce this in English, actually? Yeah, yeah, haughtiness. Haughtiness, the, exactly, haughtiness. Yeah. Um, I think it's also the haughtiness of, of drawing, the richness of, of drawing, because this is so, um, yeah, so playful and, and so witty. Yeah. And so, yeah, th this is the carnival of drawing. This is drawing celebrating itself. 
And I think here he is really playing uh, out what he can uh, with just a, a very few lines and traits. It's, it's not a lot of work that you see here. He is not sitting for hours. He's doing that quite quickly. And he's not working it out in detail. But what he did, what he does is, is so playful and, and seems so easy at the same time. Yeah. Um, uh, it's really, it, it's maybe it is my favorite. So übermütig is cocky or high spirited and but yeah. also maybe disinhibited, you know, really playful without, with mm. uh, outside the rules. Yeah. Exactly. And my real last question. Do either of you draw? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I took it up last year at 50. So it, it's completely changed my, my life, like just learning to see and, and draw. And it's getting this book at this time in my life is absolutely perfect for that reason. But but it got me wondering, <laughs> did either of you, pen, paper, um, watercolor, anything? I I draw with charcoal. I do I yeah. do some, some relatively um, simple draw, oh, drawings, it? yes. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to say it's it's you know it's no. good or anything, but no, it's it, just the act I, of drawing. It is what it is. I don't know what yeah. it is. It happens. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I uh, once was quite serious about it because um, when I was eighteen, I wasn't sure in what direction I should go. Should I study the violin? Should I uh, go to the art school and draw? Because that's what I wanted also, or should I study literature? So I, <laughs> I for, for quite some time was, was drawing quite seriously in, in high school, especially. And, uh, yeah, it gave me the idea that this could be a way to go, but I didn't follow the track. Gotcha. And again, <laughs> mirroring Kafka in certain ways. So yeah. that's, that's a good thing. In certain <laughs> ways. <laughs> yeah. And we've, oh, we've all outlived him. So that's also a, a positive as far as yeah. that goes. Yeah. But guys, thank you so much for, for the, the time this weekend. I enjoy the, the book immensely, both just to, to revel in those drawings, but to get your commentary and, and see how this, again, doesn't supplement the text, but, you know, sort of opens out Kafka in, in new ways to me. I think it's just a remarkable achievement. Thank you so much. This was really thoughtful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. From my side also, Gil. Thanks a lot. And that was Andreas Kilcher and Judith Butler. Their new book is Franz Kafka, The Drawings, out now in the U.S. from Yale University Press. It's a phenomenal book, so I hope you'll go order it and check it out at your favorite bookstore. It's probably the sort of thing that's going to show up in some some art bookstores and museums and such. But anyway, it's an amazing piece of work, and I, I really hope you guys give it a read and just revel in the drawings. Now, neither Andreas nor Judith seem to have websites of their own, and they sure aren't on social media, uh, which is a good thing, as we've pointed out. But I will put links to their university bios in the show and episode notes for this one so you can check out more about their work. Now, you can support the Virtual Memory Show by telling other people about it. Let them know there's this podcast that comes out every week with really neat conversations with fascinating creative people, uh, writers, translators, artists, cartoonists, publishers, musicians, etc. cetera. Uh, and in this case, Kafka scholars. And uh, the other thing you can do is tell me what you like and don't like about the show. Uh, tell me who I should record with, uh, what movie, TV show, book, piece of music, theater, art exhibition, etc. you think I should turn listeners on to. You can do that by sending me an email or writing me a letter or a postcard, which I'd really appreciate, uh, or by leaving me a message on my Google Voice number. That's 973-869-9659. Um, that goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about me picking up and getting stuck in an awkward conversation. Um, messages can only be up to three minutes long, so if you go over that, just call back and leave the rest of your message. And tell me if it would be okay for me to use your message in an upcoming episode of the show. Uh, I would never do that without the speaker's permission, but I figure if you've got something you want to share with uh, the listeners, might as well. Now, if you've got money to spare, don't give it to me. I, I'm doing just fine. Day job treats me well. Expenses for the podcast are pretty minimal. Um, I would really hope that if you've got resources to spare, you give to, to individuals or institutions in need. 
You can find people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Topato Go, and other crowdfunding platforms. And if you're looking for somewhere to start with institutions or foundations, I give to my local food bank, occasionally give to the Poor People's Campaign. There are a lot of other things like freedom funds, election funds, women's choice, um, Planned Parenthood, things like that, all of which can work towards building a better world. So um, I hope you'll help out. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 